Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, Nathan Lawrence here, Hoshana Rabbah. So, to be honest with you, there's probably a hundred other subjects I'd rather talk about. And I'd rather discuss things that are more, I believe, more eventually edifying to the body of Yeshua. Uh, I think Paul had the same feeling because in one place in one of his epistles, he said, I don't want to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified or Messiah and him crucified. And yet Paul, because he was dealing with physical people, he had to continually address divisions, strife, scandals, um, doctrinal questions, and all these kinds of things. The epistles are full of that. And it is essential because um, we're here to promote unity within the body of Yeshua. And that's what, what it's all about. I mean, the fivefold ministry mentioned in Ephesians 4, the purpose of the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher is to help bring the body of Yeshua into unity. And yet there's all these external forces, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Don't underestimate the power of the devil at work, even in the body of Yeshua, to cause division and strife, to sow seeds of dissension and confusion. We are constantly having to combat these. I'd rather just talk about Yeshua and the love of Yeshua and the beauty of the gospel message and the cross and how the transformative power of the resurrection and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of Elohim, to transform us and to bring us into unity and to where we can evidence the love of the spirit between all of us in unity, coming together and worshiping Yehovah Elohim and Yeshua the Messiah. But at the same time, we are physical human beings affected by many, many uh, outside and inside forces and influences. So it's a, a, it's a, it's a war zone. Um, I'm going to be addressing this today with regard to calendar issues. A couple of weeks ago, I, well, let me just back up about Nine months ago, it was brought to my attention that there existed something called the Zadok calendar and that it had something to do with Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'd never heard of this before. This was back in July. A, a noted, if I gave you his name, many of you would know him, a noted um, Hebrew Roots teacher was coming through my area. He stopped by the house. It's a man that I've known for 24 years. Uh, been a good friend. He's still a good friend, but uh, he, he uh, mentioned to me that he had moved from the uh, new moon, visible new moon, uh, a bee barley calendar over the Zadok calendar. And we didn't have time to discuss it because he had to leave and, and go somewhere else. He just came by the house briefly to say hello, which was very nice of him. And then I didn't hear anything more about the Zadok calendar until somebody on this, on our uh, Shabbat Zoom meeting brought this up about a month or so, a month and a half ago, and asked me if I'd heard of it. <laughs> and I said, well... Yes, but I didn't know anything about it, and I wasn't inclined to really study another wind of doctrine that's floating around out there. But then, for whatever reason, I decided to look up Zadok calendar on the internet after this was brought up. This was about three weeks ago. And I wanted... I wanted to find an explanation of it. And I scrolled down through about 10 different websites that gave 
calendars, but they gave no explanations. Until I came to an article written by Monty Judah in his Yavo magazine, a subject which I addressed a couple weeks ago and made a video on this, an article that he wrote apparently was in January of 2024, I believe. And I know Monty Judah. Um, I have not talked to him in many years, but he, he presented in our congregation, stayed in my home. So, um, and he's had a lot of good things to say and help a lot of people along the way. So I will give him credit for that. Although he has come up with some false teachings, which I'm not going to get into, you know, such as the book of Hebrews needs to be thrown out of the, the Bible and some other things. But he wrote an article which I found to be absolutely appalling. And I made no mistake about it, or no, no bones about that, so to speak. I was very clear. This article was a public article in his public magazine, and so I addressed it publicly. I won't go through that again, but he just flat out put out a lot of false information, just totally, totally false. And you can go back and watch that video if, you, if you're inclined to do so. Well, in the meantime, it came to my attention that I was wondering where this belief, this doctrine was coming from. And I did, somebody out of the blue uh, sent me a link to a, a message by Eddie Chumney and some of his acolytes, people that he's mentoring. Now, again, I know Eddie Chumney. I met him uh, been back in the year 2000. And he knows me and I know him. I haven't talked to him in years, but we all kind of know each other one way or the other. And I've had a lot of respect for Eddie Chumney. Uh, he's, he's, he's brought out a lot of good information uh, and helped a lot of people. So um, I went into st listening in the meantime, in the last two weeks, I've listened to three hour, hour and a half long teachings by him. Uh, another hour and a half teaching by one of his uh, acolytes. And then I've read a couple of articles. And so I'm going to address this issue of what I call the fundamental flaws of the Zadok, Priestly, or Enoch calendar. Now, let me just state a couple of things up front. There is a lot of division and strife within the Messianic Hebrew, Hebraic Roots movement. <clears throat> I don't think this comes as a news flash to anybody uh, who's, who has been in it for any period of time. My, I have been in the Hebrew Roots movement all, my, all of my life, except for several years that I was in the, in the Christian, the mainstream charismatic Pentecostal Christian church. I was born into the Hebraic Roots movement. My, I'm three, third generation in it, going back to the early 1950s. So I've seen a lot of water go under the bridge, um, so to speak. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of it as much or more than just about anybody you know. Um, and I've seen a lot of division and strife, a lot of sectarianism, a lot of cliques, a lot of cults. I was born and raised into a Messianic cult. Uh, it was a name brand cult. Uh, the belief system wasn't so much cultic, but the sociological aspect of it was definitely cultic. And we, we worshiped, if you will, a cult figure. And that was not good. We believed a lot of things that were true, and most of what we believed was true. And 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 um, the Herbert Armstrong and the Worldwide Church of God, he came on the radio and became a voice back in the early 1930s, long before any of these other people that are messianics. And he was promoting the Sabbath, the biblical feast, the dietary laws, and other Hebraic type things. Now he didn't go all the way. But that's what I was raised in. But it was definitely a cult as far as um, exclusivistic, as far as uh, control, uh, sociologically, uh, and all, a lot of things. I won't get into that. But I understand cultism, trust me. I was born and raised into it and was in it till I was age 30. 
And then when I left, I didn't let the door hit me on the way out. I kept the good things and I let the rest of it go. When I say the good things, the things that lined up with the scriptures. Now, one thing that I have observed in the Hebraic roots, Hebrew roots, Messianic movement, whatever you want to call it. I'm not big on labels, but just for the sake of knowing what I'm talking about, more or less, I use these labels. We have what I call the flavor of the month club. Um, there's new things coming along and it grabs people's attention. Twenty Over 20 years ago, it was the Lunar Sabbath. Uh, maybe even before that, it was the the allurement of rabbinic Judaism. Let's all follow the rabbis because they follow the Torah and they know about it. So let's all follow them, except we believe in Yeshua, unlike them. You know, that was a big, big movement, and it still is. And then along came various calendar issues and polygamy or plural marriage or patriarchal marriage. The King James only cult or club. The Sacred Names cult or club. Flat Earth was another one that blew up and took the world by the storm. And, you know, and then we, there's other things too. Those are some of the big ones. But I call it the Flavor of the Month Club. Something new coming along that grabs people's attention and they're off following this and off following that. The Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, the Book of this, the Book of that. You know, all these extra extra biblical books. There's people that follow that. You know, it could go on and on, and maybe you can think of a few yourself that you have encountered. I call this ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth, to quote Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 7. Why can't we study the Bible, study the word of Elohim, come to a knowledge of the truth, and stick with it? When Hoshana Rabbah, when my wife and I put up our website, uh, hoshanarabah.org, um, back in the early 2000s, I made a doctrinal statement and I put it up there. Since that time, I don't know, it was 2002 or whenever when we got our website up, I have not changed or amended that doctrinal statement. It has remained the same. Once I discover truth, I stick with it. Now, have I grown and learned since then? Yes, I have. Have I added new understanding? Yes. But I still believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I still believe in the deity of Yeshua, the virgin birth, the message of the cross, salvation by grace through faith. You know, and I could go down the list. The biblical, you know, the Torah is relevant for everyone. I've never changed any of that. The, 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 the authority of the canon of Scripture and yet you have people that come along that question the canon and question this and question that. And some of them are not important issues that are non-salvational. I mean, they're made all important, but some of them are more like twig of the tree issues, twig of the tree, not trunk of the tree issues, and not salvational. But it gets people confused and going a lot of different directions. So that's what I, what I call ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And obviously Paul and the apostles were encountering that in their day. All these winds of doctrine. Another problem that faces the Messianic Hebrew Roots movement, I'm just going to say it, lack of true scholars or those who have learned the critical thinking skills, the rules of biblical interpretation and exegesis or hermeneutics, which are based on the science of logic. Now, one can learn these things not having darkened the door of an of a academic, you know, an institution of higher, so-called higher learning. I happen to have learned these things from my background and reading and studying on my own and reading scholarly works since I was a child. But I also have studied at five universities or academic institutions, um, three actual universities, both in the U.S. and in Europe. 
And so I, you know, after five years, so I have a little bit of understanding because if you don't write your papers and do your research properly, you're going to get an F. It's just the way it is. You're going to fail. You're not going to pass your grade. So you learn to do research and you learn to study and you learn to, to look at all the evidence and, and to try to hopefully come up with the facts. And then because of my journalistic background, um, as a journalist, and I, I worked as a journalist for both newspapers and magazines, uh, several newspapers and at least one magazine, um, mostly newspapers, I did a lot of writing for many years, including for one of the, one of the larger newspapers uh, in, in the West, the U.S., a daily newspaper. Um, I, I learned that we had to do research and we had to get our facts straight and we had to look at things objectively, objectively, otherwise you might be open to um, lawsuits, slander and libel and this kind of thing, uh, specifically libel with regard to the written word. So this was drilled into me. Um, but we, we lack this, largely speaking, in the Messianic movement. There are too many self-appointed experts and teachers who have neither been mentored by or who are accountable to anyone, including spiritual elders who are full of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Why do I say knowledge, wisdom, and understanding? I say that because when Moshe or Moses back in Exodus 18, when he was advised by Yitro or Jethro, his father-in-law, to appoint elders in Israel to help him judge in matters relating to the children of Israel, you know, controversies, conflicts, and this kind of thing. You know, it was like a court of law. It was, it was, Moses was advised to find men of knowledge Wisdom and understanding. And later on, I think it's in the book of Numbers, it says that he appointed men of wisdom and knowledge. And understanding is left out. <laughs> you know, you can have a lot of knowledge and be very young. A lot of head knowledge. You can have a lot of wisdom. Maybe you've learned how to use that knowledge wisely and you can be young. But I don't mean to put anybody down. But the fact is, understanding comes with age. I believe that you have to be at least 50 years old, half a century. I've talked to a lot of people. Once they pass the half century mark, suddenly they gained a new perspective on life. For me, it hit me at about age 48. I was always about two years ahead of everybody else. Since I was a child, I was always hanging out with people that were older than me by a couple of years. But roughly the, the half century mark. Once you reach that point, that milestone in your life, you suddenly have a perspective. You've had been married, you've had children, maybe you have grandchildren. You do not have that understanding until you've gone through those things. You've had a career, you've been through a lot of things. And so we have a lot of people that are now Torah teachers who have a little bit of knowledge. Maybe they have a lot of knowledge and a little bit of wisdom. Maybe they have a lot of wisdom, but they don't have a lot of understanding. And sadly, I see a whole new batch of wonderful, young, passionate, zealous, hungry young people coming up in the Messianic movement. And they are making podcasts and they have YouTube channels and they're making videos and writing books. But they lack understanding. Now, some of them, to their credit, are getting the advice and being mentored a few by people who are older and have understanding. I know because I'm, I'm helping a few in that process. But most of them are like Rehoboam. 
the son of Jeroboam, uh, son of um, Solomon. Remember, Rehoboam lost the kingdom. Why? Because he listened to the young people of his day who said, you know, gave him advice. And, it, and he did not listen to the elders, the older men who said, be careful how you proceed with regard to some economic issues in that kingdom. And he ended up, the northern kingdom revolted as a result of, of Rehoboam following the unwise counsel of the young people. And I see this going on. I, I watch young people that Yah's rising up, and who are they primarily interviewing? Other young people. People in their 20s and 30s who, God bless them, but they do not have the wisdom and the understanding of the older people. There's a generation gap, and it's to our detriment. So there's too many self-appointed experts and teachers who have neither been mentored by or who are accountable to anyone, including spiritual elders who are full of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And we have older people who are in their 50s and 60s who have never been mentored. They're self-appointed. They've never been trained. They are not accountable to anybody. They do not have elders. Some of them are not even married. They don't even have a wife to be accountable to or children. And this is a, this is a, a fundamental flaw. If, if you are a, a man and you are in a teacher and you've never been married, you are operating at a disadvantage because at least you don't even have your wife to keep you in line. <laughs> Trust me, she will if you get out of line. I know. <laughs> I'm married. And my wife has helped me a lot. So I praise you all for that. Also, the internet, the, 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 um, the arrival and the rising up of the internet, where anyone can get up and say anything to anyone, no matter who, and, and no matter how inaccurate, off the wall, ridiculous it may be, and gain a following, especially if what they are saying is well packaged. A good package, good packaging, and good marketing can make even an unkosher trafe. Um, it can make um, trafe is that which is unkosher, abominable food, quote unquote. Look appealing, tantalizing, and palatable. Well. I'm going to put it bluntly. If you take a pile of crap, crap, BS, horse manure, and you put it in a nice package, and you put a bow and a ribbon on it and, and market it, and maybe even spritz some, some good-smelling stuff on it, somebody will buy it. And if you brainwash them, they might even open it up and eat it, thinking that it's healthy for them to do so. Because not all, not all healthy food tastes good. Some of the healthiest food doesn't taste that good. So they might actually eat this crapola, thinking that it's good for them, when it's really poison and toxins. And we have a lot of that going on. Yeshua warned us against false teachers and prophets and those who claim to be Messiah or to be anointed. Go read Matthew 24. He said, even the very elect could be deceived because they did not know the truth or have a love for the truth. Quoting Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2. So let me just say, now that I got kind of that foundation laid, when, with regard to the Zadok priestly calendar, that's the term they use, not my term, or the quote-unquote Enoch calendar, I went into this study with an open mind. I went into it, what can I learn? 
Honestly, I knew very little about the so-called Zadok priesthood, the Qumran community, the Essenes. And, you know, my understanding of the Dead Sea Scrolls was rudimentary. I've got the Dead Sea Scrolls here in my library. You know, 600 pages of them. I've got the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. I've had it there for, had them there for 20 years. But it's not something I'm going into. I've studied the history, but I'm not an expert on it. So I went in with an open mind thinking, what could I learn? And maybe, you know, my understanding of the biblical visible new moon of B. Barley, even though I've written on this, done the research, studied it out years ago and published. It's all been out there for years on our website and on my YouTube channel and on my blog. And, you know, well documented. I, I, I cite the world's best sources. I, I go into the Hebrew. I look at all the Hebrew and the Bible, everything it has to say about it, and I've written a number of articles on it. But maybe I missed something. So I go into these things with an open mind. When examining new understandings, we must be careful to guard against bias confirmation. What is that? What is bias confirmation? It's looking only to those facts that conform to our preconceived notions or our current deeply held beliefs. So when I go into something, I put my own beliefs, if you will, kind of on a shelf and try to go in as an honest inquirer objectively, like when I used to write newspaper articles, be objective, get both sides of the story, and then try to present a middle of the road approach. You know, a balanced, biased approach. I mean, non-biased approach. Let the facts speak for themselves. That's called exegesis. As opposed to reading into the facts our own interpretation and biases, which is called eisegesis. So I'm aware of all these rules of biblical interpretation called hermeneutics. And I understand, you know, I understand these things. I've written about them. I try to practice them. However, as I looked at the evidence presented supposedly proving the Zadok calendar, I began to see the glaring fall flaws in the foundation upon which these arguments were based or are based. The more I listened to the proponents of the Zadok calendar, and like I said, I read two articles on the subject, I, I, I watched three. One was by Monty Judah. I read three. I, 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 I listened to three long teachings, video teachings by uh, Eddie Chumney, list, list, um, lasting for an hour to an hour and a half apiece. I listened to another one by one of his uh, students, uh, a husband and wife couple, uh, where, he, where he's been mentoring them and their congregation. And I listened to them for an hour and a half. And I made like 10 pages of notes. And I, got, I, I, I didn't have to listen anymore. I already got it. I don't need to listen to 20 other people that talk about it. And the more I listen to the proponents of the so-called Zadok calendar, more, the more I realize that their arguments are fundamentally flawed. A house may look beautiful, but if it is built on a foundation of straw, no matter how wonderful the superstructure may look, it will fall. I soon discovered, and it is easy to see, that the arguments for the Zadok calendar are built on a foundation of straw or sand. The advocates of the Zadok calendar make many gross and misleading assumptions at the outset and build their case from that point upward. That is like saying, I'm going to, make, to put this in simple terms, that's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, and then building a system of mathematics on that premise. No matter how elaborate and sophisticated um, that system may look, it is still predicated upon a false premise and is thus erroneous and irrelevant and specious. And this is the case with the Zadok calendar. I'm going to bring you the receipts. Before I do that, I am not here to really diss anybody. I'm here to deal with the facts. The reason I mention the names of these, of these folks is because they are public figures and they are putting this out publicly. 
And so I must address it publicly. And if they want to take me to task for what I'm saying, that's fine. Give me scripture. Follow the rules of biblical interpretation. Follow the rules of biblical her hermeneutics of exegesis. Follow logic and give me scripture. I don't care how many extra biblical sources you quote. I don't care how many of the Dead Sea Scrolls writings you quote, how many scholars you quote, how many uh, apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books you quote. I want to see it in this. Otherwise, I have nothing to discuss, and I rest my case. So I challenge you. And don't cherry-pick scriptures out and twist them. Look at the context. Look at the whole context of Bible. Don't leave out certain scriptures that mitigate against your viewpoint like you all have done. And I will address that. So I'm talking to the leaders, the teachers, the so-called leaders and teachers. These are the same people that Yeshua had ex took exception with in his day, and Paul and the other apostles, and John the Baptist. They generally did not take exception. There was not a single time except one time where Yeshua took exception with the people. The people were sheep. He had compassion on the people. They were following their leaders. They didn't know any better. They trusted their leaders. Just like many of you people watching this video do also. And I don't fault you for that. But be cautious. Know those who labor among you. Be Bereans and study to show yourself approved like Timothy, uh, Paul told Timothy. And be Bereans to search out to see if these things are true. Be like what Paul told the, the saints in Thessal Thessalonica. Uh, Thess Thessalonica, yeah. Um, he said, I want to make sure I pronounce that correctly. It's not Thess Thessalonic, uh, Thessalonica. It's Thessalonica to pronounce it the, the Greek way. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. He said, prove all things. I think that's in first, was that first Thessalonians 5. Prove all things and study to show yourself approved. Or study all things, hold fast to those things which are good. Or by implication, let go of the things that are not good. Do not line up with the scripture. So I'm not taking exception with the people. Yah's precious sheep. There is no doubt in my mind that, that these people who are teaching and promoting the Zadok calendar are, by and large, well-meaning and zealous truth-seekers. Their heart is intent on serving Yehovah Elohim and rediscovering biblical truths that have been lost over time or purposely hidden by Christian and Jewish religious systems. But as we search for truth, we must make certain that we get our facts straight before moving into a new belief system so that we do not repeat the errors of the past and then propagate those errors, as has been done to us by those who have taught us in many things, both in, the Christ in Christianity and Judaism. In recent times, past erroneous belief systems have fallen away as our understanding of the Bible truth has been upgraded as we return to the truths of our biblical and Hebraic roots. The problem is that some people are ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. As soon as a new truth, or what I call flavor of the month club, comes along on the scene, too many people jump on that bandwagon, on that new wind of doctrine. It was a problem in the first century and is a problem now. Sadly, there is always a bevy of well-meaning but misguided teachers, as well as just plain false and greedy teachers who are all too willing to take people's money as they peddle their new teachings and sell their stuff. The Bible warns against us, against these folks. Therefore, and ultimately, it is up to the duty and responsibility of each Bible student to roll up his or her sleeves and prove who is right or wrong based on what the Bible says. When you buy an automobile or a house, do you just blindly take someone's word for it that it is, it is well, 
it is well, all is well? And, and, and Or do you investigate and ask questions and seek the help of others and experts to determine if what you are about to purchase is in good condition? You know, when you buy a house, you do a house inspection. You bring in experts to, you know, um, what they do, a whole house inspection is called. Experts in inspecting a house to make sure the plumbing, the electrical, the, the roof, you know, the foundation, you know, all of these things, the heating, the cooling, the air conditioning, all these things are functioning. And we should do the same thing when it comes to searching out the scriptures. Don't just take what somebody says because, he, oh, well, he's got a good website or he has the name rabbi or doctor or reverend in front of his name or he has a big church and a big following or he has a you know written some books or he's been on tv or he's got a good looking youtube channel or he's a a good teacher there are a lot of good teachers out there that if you look at their record they're money grubbers they have criminal backgrounds they have they've been married multiple times and they they're, they're, they don't have a good reputation in their local community. They've been involved in sexual scandals. I could go down the list on and on and on. They are they have uh, they've made false prophecies. We could go on and on. And oh, they look good because there's always a new batch of suckers coming along that did not remember who they used to be, or or what their past record is. Okay. So a big question we need to ask ourselves when determining whether, um, you know, are we going to, we are we going to, when we are determining truth, are, are we going to rely on the Bible primarily or on non-biblical sources? So I'm giving you a, right now I'm giving you a foundation. This is very serious. It's very important. You might want to go back and Rewatch this aspect of the video, but I'm giving you a foundation and I'm sharing with you when I approach new information, this is where I'm coming from. And this is the set of tools I use to, 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 to evaluate things. And there, a lot more could be added. I'm just giving you kind of skimming over the waves. So a big question each person has to ask themselves when determining spiritual truth is whether they are going to rely primarily or foundationally on the Bible or Primarily on secular, non-biblical sources. I have a problem, and you should too, with um, looking to a reputable scholar or extra-biblical extra sources for... Okay, let me say, I have no problem with looking to reputable scholarly or, or um, um, extra-biblical sources... Um, as for background information that supports what the Bible says. However, there is a problem when we look to extra biblical sources as our primary source of truth and then reach back to the Bible and cherry pick verses out of the Bible to confirm what the secular sources say. Did you catch that? This is really an important point, and this is very relevant to the Zadok calendar, which I will say primarily the proponents primarily, and go listen to Eddie Chumney. He hardly spends any time quoting the Bible and other people who are proponents. Mostly they're quoting extra-biblical scholars or extra-biblical sources, um, ancient sources, modern sources, scholarly sources or extra biblical uh, pseudepigraphal or apocryphal sources or Dead Sea Scroll sources, but not the Bible itself. I have a real problem with this, and you should also. And then what happens is they reach back into the Bible after determining that these extra biblical sources are authoritative, to quote Eddie Chumney, or of divine origination, which he says about the book of Enoch. 
because it was written by Enoch. <laughs> I had to laugh when I heard that one. I'm sorry. I, 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 we got to have some humor in here. The book of Enoch was written about 75 to 125 BC, like thousands of years after the, 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 the book, you know, after Enoch lived. Enoch did not write the book of Enoch. There may have been some oral traditions that came down that were thousands of years later, but how do we know how accurate they are? Now, I look to the book of First Enoch. It has some interesting things about the Nephilim that we can confirm in the Bible. But I don't look to the book of Enoch that talks about a 364-day calendar and then reach back into the Bible and cherry pick out a few scriptures, which we will go over here in a little bit, and and then and then um, use that to confirm what's in the book of Enoch. No, we find the truth of the Bible, and then if the book of Enoch or other extra biblical sources confirm that, then that's that's another outside source to witness. But they've got it backwards. This is, this is a fundamental flaw. And this is exactly what the Christian church does. This is exactly what the early church fathers do. The very thing that we are, those who are claiming to follow the Zadok calendar, that it's the true biblical calendar, they are doing the same thing that the early church fathers that I have up here in my library, I'm pointing right at them, do because of various things that were happening in the second century AD after the death of the apostles because of the influences of the persecution of the Jews and the Romans and Gentile influences and what we might call a syncretization um Many of the early church fathers began to slowly discard the Torah or Torah truths, the Sabbath, the biblical feasts, and the dietary laws, especially those things, and the Torah overall, as, as, as you know, overall. And they, because it was very difficult, for example, to keep the Sabbath without being persecuted by the Romans, they began to focus on the resurrection day as being a replacement. Sunday as being a replacement for the Sabbath. They called it the day of the Lord, even though that's not what that term means in the, in the book of Revelation or elsewhere. And they put a new spin on that term to make it look like this was now the day we're supposed to get together on to replace the Sabbath. And it happened to be the venerable day of the sun that the pagans observed to one degree or another. And then the early church fathers would reach back into the scriptures and cherry pick out, out of context, scriptures that supposedly proved their biased confirmation like oh they found the tomb empty on the first day of the week so that proves that now sunday replaces saturday or they broke bread on the first day of the week which proves that that they were getting together on sunday it was actually saturday evening which was the first day of the week on um, by biblical reckoning, but because they had a long Shabbat service, and that's when the young fellow fell out of the window, and you know that story in the book of Acts. So that proves, because Paul was long-winded, and he spoke, he's like me, or I'm like him, he's not like me, I'm like him, long-winded, and, and the, they fell asleep during his service, his teaching, and you know, thank God Paul's not the only one that that, that happened to. Um, I've had that happen to me too, um, snoring in the back of the room. <laughs> Anna probably remembers that one. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, a fellow fell asleep and he was snoring in the, <laughs> in the back of the church uh, when I was preaching. 
But anyway, you know, but the point is that, or they, or they, you know, they collected an offering on the first day of the week. And so all of these things that happened in the book of Acts and elsewhere suddenly, supposedly prove that Saturday was done away with. And now we're worshiping on the first day of the week. You see what I'm saying? And they've done that with clean and clean meats and the biblical feast. And that's exactly what the proponents of the Zadok calendar are doing. So they get almost all of their information from the book of 1st Enoch. Right here. I've got it. I've got actually three, three versions of it in my library. This is one of them. And they go to the book of Jubilees, which I have a couple versions of that sitting over here. And the book of Maccabees, which I have a couple versions of that sitting over here in multiple books that I have. And they use that to prove. And then they reach back into the scriptures. And they say they either ignore important things or they twist the scriptures to make them mean something that when I tell you what they are, you're going to like, what? How do they interpret that out of that? This is just the tip of the iceberg. And I can already tell this is going to be a two-parter. Um, let me just give some more overview. Eddie Chumney, and I, I, I'm, a, I don't know this for a fact. If he's the main uh, proponent and the origin of the this this concept, I don't know if he got it from somebody else, but he seems to be one of the main, if not the main, proponent of it. He admits that he read like eighteen to twenty books on this subject, which is quite a you know quite a admirable feat. And some of them were very scholarly, and I commend him for that. But this is who I am addressing, because Eddie Chumney is one of the main teachers out there of this, and has been a teacher in the Messianic Hebrew Roots community for, you know, 25 or more years, going back almost 30 years. And um, and I know, I first, like I said, I first met him 20, about going on 20, 24 years ago. So I respect him, but... I don't respect the position that he has taken. So I have to respectfully disagree with him. But he maintains, and there's an element of truth to this about the Zadok priesthood. The book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 talk about the Ezekiel, that it's the vision that Ezekiel had of, a, of his temple, what's called Ezekiel's temple. Now, there's many interpretations as to how we interpret it. It's one of the more difficult passages in the scriptures to interpret. Was, was uh, Ezekiel's temple simply symbolic and metaphorical? Is it going to be a millennial temple that's going to be in existence in the millennium? Or is it both? Um, I I believe it's both. I believe it's going to be a literal temple. And in there, it's and, and it hasn't been built yet. And in there, in Ezekiel, in several places, it says, the sons of Zadok, or those of the Zadok priesthood, are going to be the ones um, administering the sacrifices in the this temple. Well, who were the sons of Zadok? The sons of Zadok, Zadok the high priest was the priest during the time of David and Solomon during the during the second temp, during the first temple. Uh, when Solomon built the first temple. He was a direct descendant of Eliezer, the son of Aaron whose son was Pinchas, or Phineas. And remember, Pinchas, or Phineas, was zealous for Jehovah, and he's the one that thrust the spear or the javelin through Cosby and Zimri when they were fornicating. Cosby was a prince in Israel, and Zimri was a, 
was a, like a Moabitess woman, and the Moabite, the Moab and Ammon were coming in and subverting Israel. This was the aftermath of the Balaam incident. And it was threatened to undermine and subvert Israel with these pagan influences. And they were having sex, and he caught him in the act and killed them on the spot. And Yah promised to him an everlasting priesthood. So, Eddie Chumney maintains that that Zadok priesthood continued on down through the, and he did, I don't disagree with him, through the, through the, to the destruction of the temple, to Solomon's temple in 586 BC by the Babylonians. And then the temple was destroyed and, and the majority of Jews went into exile, into captivity in Babylon. And so the Zadok priesthood basically was terminated at that time. But when Ezra came back, 70 years later, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the exile came back to, uh, and the second temple was built. Eddie Chumney, without biblical proof, maintains that the Zadok priesthood was reestablished. Again, there's no, I cannot find any biblical proof. And the scholars that I read say that there is not biblical proof that this was the case. But we could say, okay, Yah promised them a priesthood that would last forever. So, based on that, and Eddie makes that assumption, evidently this priesthood, or ostensibly, not evidently, but ostensibly, or apparently, this priesthood was reinstated and continued in the um, in, you know during the sacrifices and the high, they were the high priests uh, during the uh, time of the second temple and then at the time of the Maccabean well and then shortly after that this is when the Pharisaic system during the intertestamental period is when the Pharisaic system and the synagogue system was established now the Pharisees if you go back and study the history of the Pharisees they were they they came about um they were the ones that established synagogues and taught the people in, in the local cities where they lived whether it be in Israel or in the diaspora and they were they were not necessarily priests they were just made up of learned scholars uh from any tribe you know tr Paul was was from the tribe of Benjamin for example uh, though he was of the Jewish religion. Um, and uh, and he was a Pharisee. He called himself Pharisee of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees controlled the synagogue system, but then eventually it was the Sadducees, that a system, that's that priestly system that developed at that time when i say at that time it was after the death of ezra and nehemiah and that 400 or so years between the old testament and the new testament that's when the sadducee system developed now the word sadducee interestingly enough comes from zadok that word sadducee comes from the Greek word Sadiq or, or, or Zadok. The word Zadok or Sadiq just means righteousness or righteous one. Okay? So Zadok, that meant he was, you know, that word means righteous or righteous one. Sadiq was a righteous one. Uh, I think I'd have to go back. Zadok, Zadok means, uh, or Zadok or Tzadok, it's T -Z T S. Or T Z A D O K. It, it just sadaka is righteousness. You know, all of these words are all related. So they're all cognates, all come from the same root. So the Sadducees purported to be the sons of Zadok all the way down to the time of Yeshua, who then became our great high priest. And when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, 
we didn't need a high priest anymore or the Zadok priesthood because Yeshua took that over. However, based on the prophecies of Ezekiel, that Zadok priesthood is going to be reestablished along with the Melchizedek priesthood, the priesthood of all believers that Peter makes reference to in First First uh, uh, Peter was it First Peter two five or is it Second Peter two five whatever it is. I think it's First Peter two five or seven five through seven he calls it the royal priesthood. So both Ezekiel and Isaiah, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to give you all the scriptures. You can go read, I think it's Isaiah 65 or 66. It's also in the, the parts of the where um, um, uh, where Ezekiel describes his vision of the temple. Ezekiel 40 through 48, where he talks about there's going to be priests from the Gentiles or from the nations who are going to be ministering, ministering in the temple along with the Zadok priests who will be actually doing the, the sacrifices. And you find all the sacrifices listed there uh, in Ezekiel. And don't, don't give me this nonsense about, well, the sacrificial system was done away with and we don't need it anymore. And that's not going to be happening during the millennium. It is going to be happening during the millennium. But it's going to be memorial. Even as the sacrifices in the past look forward to the cross, these sacrifices will be memorials and will be illustrative pointing back to the cross. Yeshua is the one and only sacrifice, as the book of Hebrews says. So these are not salvific or at, uh, sacrifices for atonement or redemption. That was done at the cross. But they are simply for illustrative, illustrative purposes. Okay? Let's just make that clear, because the Bible says it's, it's going to happen. So you're going to have the Zadok or the Levitical priesthood operating side by side at that time with the Melchizedek priesthood. And it says in three places in the book of Revelation that the saints are going to be the kings and the priests ministering with Yeshua in the millennium and in the world to come. But Eddie Chumney makes the, he makes the case, he says that the Zadok or the Sadducees priests was a false priesthood, and that all the Zadok priests all went down, they were ex excluded because of calendar issues, and I'm not going to get into those details, but because of calendar disputes, they all went to the Dead Sea somewhere around 160, 165 BC, you know, 175 BC, somewhere in that time, and they started the Qumran community. He literally says all the priests went down there. Excuse me, not all the priests, all the godly priests went down there. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, didn't was not living in Qumran. So you're wrong. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was a righteous man. In fact, he was so righteous, he was able to minister in, the, in front of the Holy of Holies. That's when he received the vision and, and was deaf, became deaf. And John the Baptist was born into that. And there were probably others. John, I believe John, the revelator, was a Levite. He, he was not part of the Qumran community. And interestingly enough, <laughs> Eddie Chumney, in one of his videos, he, he says that John, he makes, he conflates John the Baptist and John the revelator. And he says that, he says that they're the one and the same person. He gets that mixed up. I had to listen to that several times, but he, he, he conflates the two. So John the Baptist, who was not John the Revelator, the one who's responsible for the Gospel of John, one of the 12 disciples. Remember, John the Baptist was beheaded. So he ceased to exist pretty early on in Yeshua's ministry. But John the Baptist did minister down in the Dead Sea. And I've been down in the Dead Sea, Jordan, you know, the Dead Sea Valley, the Jordan River Valley. And it's not very far from Qumran. You know, it might have been 30 or 40 miles. But that we don't know if John the Baptist was part of the Qumran community. Eddie Chumney believes that he was, but there's, again, no biblical proof of this. Maybe he, inter, you know, cross-pollinated with them, Maybe he didn't. 
The Eddie Chumley also says that the great company of priests in the book of Acts that were saved in the time of uh, the apostles, that they were all members of the Qumran community in Essenes. Again, this is reading into the text. We don't know that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say where they came from. It just says that they were priests. So here we have an example of confirmation bias, reading into the scriptures, and then reading something that is not there, cramming it to fit, and painting it to, mat to match. This is poor biblical exegesis. This is called eisegesis. This is not letting the scriptures speak for themselves. This is reading your own interpretation into the scriptures to try to prove that all the early disciples were all Essenes. And he makes that statement. They're all Essenes. First of all, not all the Essenes, the, the group of Essenes, according to the scholars that I've read, Essenes and the Qumran community were two separate groups of people. The Qumran community were people that lived in Qumran. You had to go through a, a two to three year initiate prof, process, a probationary process before you could even become a member of the Qumran community. So there was only a limited number of people that became members of that community. Now, there were groups of Essenes who, it would appear, held to some of the beliefs, maybe many of the beliefs, I don't know, of the Qumran community. But they lived in different parts around the country. In fact, in Jerusalem, there was an Essene quarter. You can go there and see it to this day. I've been there. So not all the Essenes were Qumranites, and the term Qumran community or Zedekite is not necessarily analogous to Essene. And yet, Eddie Chumney conflates the two. So he says that the all the Zedekites, all the, the direct genealogical descendants of Aaron, through Pincus, through uh, I mean, Eliezer, through Pincus, down to Zadok the priest at the time of uh, David and Solomon. All of those priests all went to Qumran when they had a calendar dispute with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Again, we cannot prove this. Now, how, how is it that Eddie Chumney comes to this conclusion? Because secular scholars say that. Because the book of Jubilees and the book of Maccabees says it. But not because the Bible says it. So we're relying on extra biblical sources to tell us all of this. And yet there are other scholars who I've read, like these guys. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls in a 600-page volume. And Eddie Chumney has this book, he quotes from this book, and he even shows, on one of his videos, he shows this book, which I have in my library, I've had this for years, and he quotes from it, and he shows it on screen, and yet this very book, a commentary which explains what the Dead Sea Scrolls says, it says in here, based on the text of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls community, or the Qumran community, called themselves sons of Zadok. But that could mean that we are sons of righteousness. They could be using that term metaphorically. Or it could be taken to mean we are literal genealogical descendants of Zadok the priest. But the Dead Sea Scrolls is not clear on what exactly it means when it says we are sons of Zadok. Because they use a lot of metaphorical terms such as sons of light, preacher of righteousness, you know, teacher of righteousness, all of these things. They use a lot of terms 
to refer to themselves vis-a-vis -vis the established religious system in Jerusalem run by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So to say that, that, they, that the Qumran community were descendants, literal, genealogical, biological descendants of Zadok, the priest, there is absolutely no biblical proof for that, and there's no way to know that, because there is about 800 years separating between Zadok the priest and the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Now let me ask you a question. Can most of you definitively trace your ancestry back 800 years? I mean, we have 23andMe, Ancestry.com. We have, I've done genetic tests on both of those. My wife, she's putting together our family tree and she's gone back. But I can't trace my lineage, even with the help of the internet and DNA, back 800 years. And most of you can't. Unless somebody was keeping records along the way. And records were not kept along the way because they were all destroyed when the temple was burned in 586 BC. So all they had is oral tradition. They didn't have written records. Now, maybe they hid some scrolls away. I don't know. I mean, we had the, we had the Torah scroll and some of those that were hidden away and they rediscovered them. So they were not all destroyed in the, in the temple when the temple was confl conflagrated, uh, when it was destroyed, Solomon's temple. But, do, but we, we don't have any, and that's how we got the Bible and the Torah that came down to us. But there is no evidence, written evidence, to make the claim that the Dead Sea Scrolls inhabitants or the Qumran inhabitants were genealogical descendants of Zadok any more and that they were the true descendants any more than to say that the Sadducees were. You can make the claim either way. So this is another one of the fundamental fallacies of the people that follow the Dead Sea, uh, the Zadok calendar. Now, Eddie Chumney makes the claim that the 364-day year of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar goes back to the book of Enoch, First Enoch. There's a lot of books of Enoch, but we're talking about the book of First Enoch. Now, the book of First Enoch, nobody knows for sure when it was written, but somewhere between, I think, 75 and 125 B.C., during the time of the intertestamental period of time. But it was not written by Enoch because Enoch had been dead for, what, thousands of years. So how can we link this back to Enoch and definitively say this calendar of 364 days is the calendar that Enoch had? Though this book makes the claim. Now, I can read a few things in the book of Enoch that do line up with Scripture. And those things, I will look to the book of Enoch because it's corroborated in the scriptures. Okay? But the things that are not corroborated in the scriptures, I cannot look to the book of Enoch. Now, they reach back. The proponents of the Dead Sea, of the Enoch or Zadok calendar reach back and they quote the Bible were during the time of Noah's flood, and they say, well, you see, there are four instances where dates are given when Noah did this and did this and this. And see, that proves that that was the, the 364-day Zadok calendar because certain things fell on certain days. That's not proof of anything. That's reading into it. You don't know what days those fell on, on the calendar, because we're looking back 4,000 years. And we don't know the exact dates when those happened. So when the flood happened, we don't know the exact year. We know the approximate, not the exact year. So how can you say that these are the exact dates? We're looking back 
for, again, 4,000 years. Actually, more than 4,000 years. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. It's, it's, it's like 4,500 years ago. And then he, Eddie Chumney claimed that Noah established these, this calendar, and this was, and, and the book of Enoch records it, and that this is of divine origination and authoritative. Those are his words. What Noah says is not authoritative and divine origination. What, what Yah says is of divine origination. Noah didn't make the calendar. Enoch did not make the calendar. And yet this is what they're saying. Furthermore, they claim that the all of the ancient civilizations, Babylonian, Egyptian, uh, Mesopotamian, Syrian, um, Persian, they all follow the lunar calendar, which apparently they did. And it was based on the visible new moon sighting. Well, I read in this book from the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Egyptians, at least this is what some scholars are saying, the Egyptians did not follow the new moon calendar uh, the visible new moon, they followed the conjunction, or what's called the astronomical new moon. Eddie Chumney fails to bring this point up. And he also mentions, he fails to mention, well, let me, I'll get into that in a minute. Let me, let me just, I'll, 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 okay, I'll mention this. That the, according again to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the um, Qumran community had five calendars that they followed during the course of their 240 year history or whatever five not one he claims that they only had one calendar and that was the enoch 364 day a year calendar but according to the dead sea scrolls they had five calendars which there was a controversy as to which one we're going to follow and the zadok calendar was only one of them and one of the five calendars was a lunar solar calendar based on the new moon. Again, I, I can give you this, the references from here. So there again, we're not being given the full truth on this because we are being told they only had one calendar that the Zadok priests brought the true calendar with them and the Qumran community adhered to that calendar until its demise in roughly 70 A.D., for 240 years. Again, a, pro a point that cannot be proven from the Bible only by going to extra, and even from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, back to the this Babylonian calendar. Eddie Chumney and others are really strong to make the point that because the lunar calendar, and they call the biblical calendar the lunar calendar. Actually, they are incorrect on that one. It's a lunar solar calendar. Anybody that understands the biblical calendar understands it's not strictly a lunar calendar. It cannot be a lunar calendar because the lunar year only has 354 days in it and the solar calendar has 365 and a quarter days. So there's roughly an 11-month differential, I mean, 11 day differential each year between the lunar cycle and the solar cycle. So if you follow strictly a lunar calendar, you're going to be falling each year 11 days behind. I know this is very confusing to some of you. There's a lot of information. I, I cannot go into each of these details and these points. You'd have to go back and read my articles on the Biblical calendar, 
and you may have to watch this video again. I'm sorry, this is a machine gun, you know, rapid fire approach. Those of you who understand what I'm talking about, you'll understand it. Others, I'm sorry, this is, you know, we're in the, we're swimming in the deep waters now and it may be confusing, but you may go need to go back uh, and watch this. But I've been swimming in these waters for 35, 40 years, intensely for 24 years. And so I'm kind of an expert on the subject, I guess you could say. Anyway, and so the Bibli the Hebrew calendar, and the Hebrew scholars admit this, it's not a strictly a solar calendar. It's it goes off the, the new the months go off of the off of the uh, lunar cycle, but the years go off of the solar cycle. So every three years, a thirteenth month. Remember, you're losing uh, 11 days every year because the lunar cycle is 11 days shorter than the solar cycle. So after three years, you're going to be roughly 33 or 34 days off. And so you need to inter intercalate or add a leap month or a another month. Well, and that's what's called an Adar Bet. And... Um, this is this is this is to bring the lunar year lunar cycle into conjunction or into alignment with the solar cycle so that the feast days fall in their seasons so that because the seasonal cycles have to line up with the feast day cycles and that's a whole other discussion it's the, it's it's the it's the plan of salvation in the in the in the seasonal cycles, the, the 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 agricultural cycles of ancient Israel, okay. Again, we've talked and taught about that. And that's a, that's a whole nother discussion. Um. So, Eddie Chumney claims that this calendar, this lunar calendar, is of pagan origination, and that if we're going to come out of Babylon, come out of her, my people, Revelation 18, 4, we've got to leave the paganism. And he's claiming that the, that the Jews brought the Babylonian pagan lunar calendar back from Babylon with them. And under the influence of the Babylonians, and he's really unclear about this because obviously... He, 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 well, they brought it back with them, but they obviously didn't bring it back with Ezra because Ezra was doing the right thing. He was a priest, but he, he, he's a little muddy on this, but that is say not Ezra, but uh, Eddie Chumney. And he says that they, that the uh, Jews under the influence of the Seleucid Greeks, um, or the, they were actually Syrians under, um, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he was the ruler of the Seleucid Greeks that gave rise, that, you know, that, that took over the temple, offered pigs on the altar, and that's what gave rise to the Maccabean Revolt of 165 or so AD, uh, I mean BC, and that's where the Feast of, or the Feast of Hanukkah comes from. And again, I won't get into all that. He says that the, that the Jews... Um, had this false lunar calendar imposed on them by the Syrians who got it from the Babylonians. And therefore, the lunar calendar is a false calendar. And we need to stop worshiping Elohim on the wrong day, on a wrong pagan calendar. And therefore, we're going to go to the calendar that came out of the book of Enoch, because Enoch was a man of God, and he walked with God, and this book supposedly was written by Enoch. I'm not making this up. This is what he's saying. And this is what the proponents are saying. The fundamental flaw with that is this. Let me give you an illustration. I have encountered people to say, uh, encountered people who said, we cannot believe anything the Catholic Church teaches. It's all a lie. 
So reject the Catholic Church and throw the baby out with the bathwater because they teach lies. To which my response is, does the Catholic Church believe that the Bible is the word of God? Does the Bible, does the Catholic Church believe in the virgin birth? Does the Catholic Church believe that Yeshua resurrected from the dead? That he is God in the flesh? And the son of Elohim? Yes. Should we throw that out? No. So what do we do? We exercise our brains. We eat the fish and spit out the bones. We separate the wheat from the chaff. We separate out that which is from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We take the good from the evil and let the evil go. We make a difference between the holy and the profane. As Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 43 or 44. And so to say that everything that the Babylonians did was evil is broad brushing. Everything that they believed is false. Because what calendar did Adam and Eve follow? What calendar did Enoch follow? Did Noah follow? You can't prove it was the 364-day calendar. There's no proof of that. So whatever calendar, let's say, Noah followed, Noah passed that truth down to his son, Shem. Shem lived for hundreds of years after the flood. He lived until the time of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. That's when Shem died. Shem was a very from ancient extra-biblical sources, Shem is probably who taught Abraham. And Shem is the one that, from again, extra-biblical sources, that probably promoted these, these truths. And the Babylonians picked it up. You can just as well make the assumption that the lunar solar calendar that the Jews followed came down from Shem just as easily as, and the pagans picked that up. Just as easily as they can make the claim that the Dead Sea Scrolls or that the Zadok calendar came from the Book of Enoch. Now, interestingly, also, you know, we come back to this scripture in Exodus 12, verse 2, which Eddie Chumney spends about five minutes talking about, and that's all. And he makes a very interesting um, declaration. He says that the, when the Bible refers to the month of the Abib, in Exodus 12, verse 2, and several other places, I think six places, that that is a Canaanite name. That is a Canaanite designation for the first month of the year. And therefore, he diminishes the validity of that name. He flat out says that. It's a Canaanite name. And yet my Bible says, now verse 1, Exodus 12, 1, Now Jehovah spoke to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, quote, these are the words of Jehovah, not the Canaanites. This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And then he goes on to call it the month of the Abib. This is the term. This would be in... Yes, uh, Exodus 13, 5. Moses is repeating the instructions of Jehovah. And 
he is referring to this month, verse 4, as the month of the Abib. Where do we see that this is a Canaanite term? This is a term that Moses used to explain the direct instructions that Yehovah gave to him. The word Abib, and Eddie does not even mention this, Monty Judah claims the word Abib, and we talked about that last week. The month of the Abib, a word Abib means spring. But there is no lexicon, and I have all the main ones in the English language up here, from the Hebrew scholars, as well as all the Bibles, they all translate Abib as being spring or or in the barley or the spring or green in the ear. And Eddie totally overlooks that. When he says that the new year is determined by the vernal equinox and makes no mention of the month of the Abib, the month of the barley. Now I ask the question, where in the Bible is the vernal equinox ever mentioned to or alluded to? In my research, I can find not a single place. It's because the ancient Hebrews did not look to the vernal equinox. Only when you go to extra-biblical sources... including the Babylonians, they looked to the vernal equinox later on. This is just the tip of the iceberg with regard to the fallacies of this whole thing. The idea that is being promoted here is that because the Zadok priests, genealogically descended Zadok priests, all went to, found refuge in Qumran and established their community, and they remained faithful to the calendar that Enoch supposedly invented under divine origination, which for which we have no biblical proof, that these Zadok priests, who were not fulfilling the Zadok, Zadokite role that Ezekiel prophesies, who were prophet, who were um, offering sacrifices in Ezekiel's prophetic temple, they were not doing that down in Qumran, but. Chumney claims that these priests are fulfilling that prophetic role. Again, picking scriptures out of context, cramming it to fit, painting it to match, to confirm our beliefs. He's saying that we need to become like the Zadok priests. He's not claiming that we are, but that as Christians we need to come out of Babylonianism. And he flat out says that we need to follow the things in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I had to listen to that several times. He said, we need to follow the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's going to help us to come out of Babylon in these end times, so that we can be the end time people of Elohim who are worshiping and serving him according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. I am not making this up. Go watch the videos yourself. They're on the internet. And you will see that what I'm saying, this is what these folks are purporting. Now, I, there's a lot more, but I think I'm going to bring it to a close here. We've already been going for about an hour and a half. I'm sorry for the length of this. Um, let me just make sure that I... He admits that most of our information comes from the book of Jubilees. 
the book of Enoch, and secondarily from the first and second book of Maccabees, and then all these other books that he's written that are extra biblical. Um, he does not discuss the barley. He does not discuss the book, the, the month of the Abib. He does not discuss Rosh Kodesh. Now, others do. Let me just mention this. This is going to, this is going to tie your mind in pretzels. Um, Eddie did not say that. Oh, actually, Eddie did say that going back to Exodus 12, verse 2, which I read, Now, Yehovah spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year. He's, And so, uh, speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth month of every... On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father and lamb for a household. So on the tenth day of the month, the first month of the year, they took out a lamb, separated it, and then on the fourteenth day, which is Passover, they sacrificed that lamb that had been living in their house for several for four days. Eddie flat out said that this verse, in this verse, Yehovah is not advocating when the new month begins. He's telling them, do not follow the lunar calendar. Flat out says that. It does not explain it. Eddie also goes in and he talks about the term, the head of the month, Rosh Kodesh. And he says that this is not talking about this, that this is the the you know the first day of that month it's just that this is the first month of the year the problem is that the word kodesh if you look it up and it's used about what 460 times in the old testament alone i think it's 460 times every lexicon every bible translation that i have read every scholarly source Hebrew scholar, not we're I'm not a Hebrew scholar, Eddie's not a Hebrew scholar. We know enough, we know about we know some Hebrew, but we're not Hebrew scholars, we're not Hebrew linguists. They all say it means renewal, as in new month. Universally, everything I've read. Yet he is saying this is not referring to when the new month begins. In fact, I mentioned to you earlier that the Dead Sea Scrolls have five different calendars, and one of them was a new new moon calendar. And there is debate among the Dead Sea Scrolls translators and scholars as to whether for them the new moon began with the visible crescent or the full moon. There are people that believe that the full moon is the beginning of the month, even to this day. Some people believe it's a visible new moon, as I do, and some people believe it's the conjunction. You see all the confusion? So here, Eddie Chumney, in the interest, supposedly, of bringing unity to the body, he's adding more confusion and not giving you the... leaving these questions unanswered and not giving you foundational evidence to prove his point. It's like throwing mud up against the barn wall and hoping some of it will stick. Now, I listened to another video by a couple of his protégés, and they said here that, and they're quoting Eddie, constantly quoting Eddie Chumney, who taught them directly in their living room, so they say, and I have no reason to doubt them, that verse 12 here, I mean, Exodus 12, verse 2, when it says, this month shall be your beginning of months, it is not saying that this is the first day of the month. Rather, it is saying that this is their first month. So I go down here and read verse 3, speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th day of this month. And they said that actually the 10th day of the month is the first day of the month. I kid you not, this is exactly what they say. 
Yeah, it's a head shaker. And I'm asking myself, the Bible says it's the 10th day of the month. That would mean that 10 days earlier was the first day of the month. So how can you say that when they separated the lamb out, that was the 10th day of the month? Yet this is what they say. You want to hear something else? They also say, because to me, one of the big arguments for the visible new moon of B barley calendar, and that this was the calendar that the Jews were following in the time of Yeshua, the second temple, until they changed it in 359, 360 AD, when the Hillel calculated calendar came along. Obviously, Yeshua died on the cross on Passover day. And he kept Passover, an early Passover, at the beginning of the 14th. And he was crucified on the 14th, going into the 15th, when the, the Jews were, were, were uh, offering up their Passover lamb. What these people tell us is that Yeshua actually kept his Passover on the 13th, which was the real 14th day of the month. And he died on the 14th day of the month, which was actually on the Zadok calendar, the 15th day of the month. But he died a day later off of the Zadok calendar on the 15th day to show the Jews that he was their Passover lamb. So he kept the Passover on the 14th day on the Zadok calendar, died on the 15th day of the Passover on the Zadok calendar, which was actually the 14th day on the lunar, lunar solar calendar. So therefore, according to them, he did not fulfill the types and the shadows because in Egypt, the lamb was slaughtered on Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And they're saying that on the Zadok calendar, he was crucified on the 15th day. So Yeshua did not fulfill perfectly that type and that shadow. Again, I'm not making this up. This is what they are saying. It's really, I believe, a lot easier just to believe the lunar solar calendar and believe that he act, Yeshua actually did die on the 14th day and that the Jews did have the right calendar until they changed it to the present rabbinic calendar. But... I don't have an exclusive, unique teaching that I'm trying to peddle to sell books, to sell videos, to, to get speaking engagements, to start a new following, to follow after me, to start a new little cult called the Zedekite Qumran cult, and everybody else is part of Babylon, and we're the ones that have the truth. And yet this is what many people who are following this believe about themselves and believe about the rest of us. All right. Is there anything else I want to say? I'm sorry this has been long-winded. Um, I think that's it. Um, there's more I could bring out, but I'm not going to. It, we can get further into the weeds, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, I'm sorry that this has been a little bit disjointed. Please forgive me if this has been rather confusing. Guys, let me be honest with you. I don't make my living from the ministry. I own a tree service. I'm an arborist, a very highly credentialed consulting arborist, an expert in my area. I'm still working 50 or 60 hours a week in my business. I have employees. I've got a lot to do. I'm sorry that I was not able to do a better job of putting this teaching together in a more line-by-line, -line, cohesive, flowing manner. I simply do not have the time. Like I say, I do not make my living from the ministry. The ministry does not and never has given me enough money to support me, to my family and my wife and I, to, to be able to do the ministry full-time. So I have not been able to spend an entire week beautifully crafting this thing into a an eloquent oratory. But I pray and I hope that the information I gave you, 
that you can parse it out and sort it out in your mind. And hopefully, if you, you may need to listen to it again, but the information is accurate. I have all the information here in my notes, which maybe I will publish with all of the videos, the YouTube um, URL references, and it's all here. I went over this painstakingly, listen to their videos, watch things over and over and over again to make sure I got accurate information. And so I'm giving you the best information that I have, the most accurate information as an objective, honest, biblical researcher and journalist, if you will. And I hope that my muddy presentation, that somehow after the waters settle, it will become clear to everybody listening. And I pray that somehow y'all can use this information to help people navigate the end time confusion that is coming out from so many different places. All right, I'm finished. Thank, thank y'all. And hopefully this will be the end of this discussion for the time being. And we can get on to talking about Yeshua, the gospel, and what, what, how wonderful he is and the transforming power of the gospel message. And we can get stabilized in our understandings of basic biblical 101 stuff so that we can prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives transformatively by the power of his spirit to be the bride that Yeshua wants us to be. Amen. Hallelujah. Shalom. Thank you.